This is my railroad. Men working at routine jobs. Men and women working in shops and offices, in yards and on the line. If you walked halfway to the nearest hills, halfway to the horizon, and looked back, you would not see these men. They would be lost in one of the small furrows in the great face of this country. Yet such men working together have changed that face small crews of men who cannot be seen from halfway to the horizon. Railroad men, working at first with hand tools, and later with hand tools and machinery, made it possible for us to open up this country and make it possible for us to keep our nation running. This is my railroad. People on the move, on long trips and short trips. Traveling for jobs, for rest and recreation, to visit friends or relatives, or to keep a business going. We are hosts of the travelers of a nation. They are our friends and we make them welcome. This is my railroad, workhorse of a nation, hauling the products of the forest, the farm, the range, of the orchard, mine, and factory. Logs from the Siskiyous, the Cascades, the Sierras, from New Mexico, Texas, and Louisiana. Lumber of pine, fir, and hemlock, of cypress, redwood, and cedar. Livestock from the hills, the plains, the bayou meadows. Out of the earth itself, sulfur, copper, oil, lead, zinc, salt, antimony. Copper ore from the mine, copper ingots from the smelter. Harvests of wheat, rice, and barley. Harvests of sugar, sugar from cane, 
sugar from beets, fruits and vegetables from the garden spots of a nation, grapes, apples, pears, carrots, celery, tomatoes, oranges, grapefruit, lemons, lettuce, potatoes, melons. The full bounty of the orchard and the farm, the bounty of the Northwest, the West, the Southwest, and the South, moved as if distance were non-existent, moved to markets a continent away. This is my railroad, artery of a nation. The food we eat, the materials of industry, the goods of commerce, all are carried by wheels on rail, wheels that keep our nation vigorous and strong. This is my railroad. In the beginning there was nothing, no rail, no roadbed, no rolling stock, nothing but primeval wilderness, the endless and tragic desert, the rolling plains, mountains with granite spurs and deep ravines, the quiet whisper of the forest. At first, the white man came as trapper, explorer, trader. Russians from the north, Mexicans from the south, Americans from the east. No man's land or every man's. And then, brought our people in endless streams across 2,000 miles of misery and hardship. Some found gold and some did not, but most stayed for few dared face the long and hazardous return. Homes rose, farms were cleared, and towns were laid out. Towns that were later to become great cities. There was more wealth in the fields, herds, and orchards than ever came from sluice or pan. An empire was building in the West. The threads that bound it to the nation were tenuous and thin. Firm union needed bands of steel. A path was cleared by axe. Hand drill and black powder moved the rock. The earth was loosened by the pick. The shovel raised it. Ties were hewed by broad axe. Rail was laid, bolted, and spiked down. When our last spike was driven, the first train moved across the continent. As the west and southwest grew, so did the railroad. Each was dependent on the other. The earth, the water, the fertility, and the promise, these had always been there. The railroad opened them for the benefit of man. Where the rails went, there went the modern world. Where they stayed away, the wilderness remained. The men and women of the southwest and the west built the railroad for their use and it has served them well. This is my railroad, a heritage from the past, a service to the present, a dream for the future still to come. Yes, this is my railroad, and it's a big one. Lots of different kinds of jobs, and lots of men who know how to do them. Yardmen, for instance. In this yard and in scores of others, from Portland to Los Angeles to New Orleans, from Ogden to San Francisco, big yards, little yards, flat yards, saucer yards, hump yards, yards of all description. Have you ever wondered how we keep the cars untangled? Why we shove them back and forth from one track to another? Well, that's my job and I'd like to show you. 
Here's where we start. A string of cars picked up from local shippers. They're all mixed up. Some will go to a distant city, some to a nearby town. We have to sort them out. They must be assembled with cars picked up by other locals into blocks like these. The first of these blocks, let's say, goes east, the second west, the third to a nearby state, the fourth clear across the continent. So when you see a yard like this, that's what it means. Each of these blocks is like a different drawer in a filing cabinet. Some go to different destinations. Some require special handling, like this block of reefers that has gone to the icing dock. It is icing like this that makes it possible for us to carry perishable fruits and vegetables clear across the continent. The cars will be iced again at regular intervals throughout their trip. Or take small shipments like a bundle of brooms or parts for a machine. Less than carload lots, we call them, or LCL for short. These are picked up by our vans at the shipper's door, sorted on the loading dock, and the shipment stowed in the proper car. The blocks of cars are joined to their respective trains. Some of these freight trains, the famous overnights, for instance, and the hotshot manifests, travel as fast as all but the fastest passengers. So fast, in fact, that waybills must be teletyped ahead to beat them to their destination. Well, here we are back at my job, sorting cars out in the yard. It's not as easy as you think. You take 50 tons and start it rolling, and you don't stop it by saying please. Not unless you've judged it right. Not unless you've judged your speed, weight, and distance. You see this car coming down the lead? Maybe there's automobiles in that car. Maybe eggs or china. If we've kicked it too fast for the distance it has to travel, it will hit like a head-on collision. Let's say we ride it. See how easy it's coming in? Right to the coupler like a cushion. That hogger's a good man. But take a look from his point of view. Can't see much, can you? You need to be guided in. And here's the man who can do it for him. You see that signal? It means, take it easy, buddy, you're getting close. These men know how to run a railroad. And where one finishes, another one takes over. The work of a railroad is never done. Couplings and journal boxes are inspected. A yard clerk checks cars against the waybills. Another gives them the code numbers of their destinations. Finally, the train is ready for the road. The conductor and engineer compare their watches. When the time comes, the engineer eases the throttle open. The drivers turn. The freight pulls through the yard. Reaching open country, the engineer lets her roll. There are trains ahead of him, behind him, coming in the opposite direction, all on a single line of track. Yet he is confident. His confidence is in this man, the dispatcher, sitting at a desk, holding in his hands the threads of wire that guide the destinies of passengers and freight. We have as many as 30 trains traveling in two directions at different speeds at one time on a hundred miles of single track. The way we handle them is this. Stations phone us as the trains pass. We check one against another and write train orders to control them. The orders are phoned ahead and picked up as the trains pass. This freight, for instance, will reach a certain siding just as another freight coming in the opposite direction has holed up to let it pass. 
rocket will then proceed for, say, another 10 miles, when the brakeman, having thrown the switch, it will take a siding, so that a fast passenger train overtaking it from the rear may continue at unbroken speed. It's as simple as that. Of course, you have to time it right. And, brother, you'd better be right. As a double check, there is the automatic block signal system. As a train enters a signal block, all signals affected by that block are automatically set. So long as his signals are clear, the engineer knows that the track ahead is clear. He can proceed safely and with confidence. A new method of dispatching called Centralized Traffic Control, or CTC for short, has been installed on the busier sections of our line. On this board, each train shows up as a separate light. The dispatcher can watch them as they move along. Here you see a train on the main line passing another on a siding. Working electronically and with the different signals interlocked, CTC may increase single track capacity by as much as 50%, a valuable machine, but it takes a good man to run it too. Each member of the train and engine crews has his special duties. The engineer, the fireman, the conductor and the brakeman. By day, by night. In summer and in winter. Their loyalty to their jobs and the quality of their performance are a vital element in the welfare of our nation. For these men are railroaders. Men who keep the railroad running. This is my railroad. A railroad knows the beauty of the earth, the beauty of the season, traveling with the days as they travel through the year. Spring is the gentle season, as fragile as the blossom on the branch. Spring brings the poppy to the coastland. It brings the yucca to the hills. Blue bonnets spread across the Texas fields. Along Louisiana bayous, the bright azalea lights a glowing flame. Even the desert wasteland wakens to the touch of spring. As the year turns, the sun lies hot upon the flowered meadow. It's cooler in the leafy glen. A bright stream plays among the granite rocks, lies quiet on the sandy bar. As the year grows, it brings the time of harvest. Colors turn upon the trees, a delicate tracery on the leaf. A broad brush stroke on the mountainside. The season of the burning bush gives way to the season of the silver mantle. Winter brings the silent snow, the muffled brook. Winter is the time of waiting, waiting for the coming year. This is my railroad, constant yet ever varied, as varied as the seasons, as constant as the year. Steam rising in the morning air, power ready for the road. How do we know it's ready? Because our men make certain. After each run, every engine, whether passenger or freight, goes to the roundhouse for inspection. Inspected, serviced, and washed down, we know that this daylight engine leaving the roundhouse at Los Angeles will answer the throttle with full power.
Passenger cars are likewise cleaned and serviced, washed down with soap and water as bright as new. Once a month, each engine is given a more thorough going over, a real checkup by doctors of motive power. Here, a daylight engine gets a minor adjustment to a drive rod. Major repairs and overhauls are undertaken in our shops. Here in our Sacramento shops, or in our shops at Los Angeles, Houston, Portland, El Paso, Sparks, and Ogden, we are equipped to handle any job that may arise. In the old days, we were the only railroad with headquarters in the far west. Working at a distance from our sources of supply, we learned to do things for ourselves. Like here in our foundry, where we still cast our wheels and brake shoes, and our forges, where we have hammers and presses of all sizes, and through to the final machining, where no job is too large or too exacting. Altogether, we find it economical to make hundreds of items many other railroads buy. This cylinder, for instance. In emergencies, we even do jobs for other railroads they can't do themselves. If we had to, we could build a locomotive from the ground up. We don't usually go that far, but sometimes we come close to it. Every couple of years or so, an engine must be taken apart and rebuilt inside and out. This AC, for instance, with its insides out, goes into the shop at Sparks, Nevada for a real facelifting. Rebuilt and repainted, the engine is reassembled under the careful, watchful eyes of old timers who know how to ease 250 tons to a micrometer adjustment. The job is done. Tested and with steam up, the engine's ready to take the road again. Of course, an engine wouldn't be much good if it didn't have cars to pull. So here at Houston, Texas, as in our other shops, we rebuild cars as well. It doesn't look like rebuilding, does it? But that's the first step. First, you tear them down. Then a sandblast cleans them behind the ears. A good scrubbing from one end to the other. Here, a crew straightens the bulged end of a car. Mostly, our men are from old railroad families. Railroading has come down to them from their fathers before them, and they've grown up with it all their lives. They know what it takes and how to give it. Here's a car that was pulled off the road because it was no longer fit for service. Soon it comes out as good as new. A coat of paint, and it'll be ready for the road again. Yes, shop men are the men who keep them rolling. A railroad could not long continue to perform its service to the passenger and shipper if it were not for the shop men whom the passenger and shipper never see. Yes, sir. One reaper. Tomorrow. Oranges for New York. Cars going east, cars going west. Passenger trains, freight trains, work trains. Moving by day and night, moving in all directions. How do they keep untangled? How is this many-sided world of interweaving movement run? It is run by words by written words on paper. Clerk, typist, and accountant. These are railroad men and women as truly as any other. Paperwork controls all other work. The work of a railroad starts when we sell a ticket or sign a bill of lading. From the bill of lading, the way bill is typed up. See the fingers of this girl go.
you have to be so careful. Such a little mistake, and everyone gets so excited. Oh, I don't mean they shouldn't, really. I mean, so much can happen from one little thing. Sometimes, if you strike just one key wrong, something that's supposed to go one place can go a thousand miles away. It may take weeks to straighten out, and that means work for people you've never even seen, and sure hope you won't. And then the customer gets angry and files a claim, and that means more work still. You have to be so careful all day long. Reams and reams of paper, millions of words, and a misplaced comma can cause trouble for a thousand people. Operating documents, inventories, statistical analyses, advertising and publicity, accounting records, the money that comes in and the money that goes out. Words on paper, they determine all our actions. Our planning, our operations, our duties, our agreements. Even our service to the public is prescribed on paper. The typewriter, the billing machine, the teletype. All of these determine the movements of our trains, just as surely as the CTC board and the switch. This is my railroad, and these are railroad people, men and women who keep the railroad running. A railroad is best served by straight and level lines, but nature does not design her contours to meet our needs. So with engineering skill and knowledge, we must select a route. First, we study it on the spot. Then, as a plan on paper, at what speed can we take these curves? How many engines will be needed to pull a freight train up these grades? The paper plan is carried out. Earth is cut from one place, and filled in in another. Cut and fill. This is the basic pattern. Cut and fill. Where a cut would be too deep, a tunnel is driven through. Where a fill would be too great, a trestle or viaduct spans the gap. Curves are as gradual as they can be made. The speed at which a train may travel depends as much upon the curves and gradients of the track as on the power of the locomotive. All curves, including even horseshoe bends, are swung in as broad an arc as topography permits. This holds true even where a complete circle is formed, as on the famed Tehachapi Loop where one end of a train passes over the other. On level track, trains can roll easily at top allowable speeds. The slightest upgrade, even when imperceptible to the eye, will slow us down. As the rise increases, helper engines may be needed. On heavier grades, helpers may be needed on passengers as well as freight. In some places, as many as four engines may be used to take one train across the mountain. Where all else fails, we build our bridges. Across streams and rivers, across dry arroyas in the desert. The Martinez Bridge near San Francisco. The famous Lucen Causeway across the Great Salt Lake. The Huey Long Bridge across the Mississippi at New Orleans, longest in the system. And a high one, the Pecos River Bridge in Texas. Every bridge and viaduct 
an exacting feat of engineering. There are more than 10,000 on our lines. This is my railroad, piercing the granite mountains, spanning the deep ravine, molding nature's contours to the benefit of man. This work train and dozens like it move constantly along our lines doing the 101 odd chores necessary to keep a railroad running. Ditches to be cleaned, shoulders to be widened, an old siding to be taken up. Our job right now is to widen this narrow cut. You know, a railroad reminds me a whole lot of my kids. If you've got kids, you'll know exactly what I mean. Daddy, I want a new road bed, huh? Daddy, I want a wider cut. Oh, gee, you promised, didn't you? So we keep our promise. Yes, they keep their promise, and they keep the railroad running. Trains run on roadbeds, rails, ties, ballast. These are the foundations on which we operate. It is not enough to build them once. They must be kept in top-notch condition from day to day, month after month, year after year. The work of the maintenance of waymen is never done. Inspection, finding things before they happen, is as important as maintenance itself. The track walker pursuing his lonely way looks for defects in rails, bolts, spikes, for anything that may cause future trouble. Concealed defects are sought as well. The sand's mirror looks beneath the ball of the rail. The rail detector car looks inside the rail itself. Buildings and bridges need constant care as well. From the large office buildings, such as our general offices, which you see here, to a small station, miles from anywhere. Men constantly at work, building and repairing. Men of many skills, working steadily, loyally, expertly, to keep a railroad running. Trestles, viaducts, and bridges, carrying the weight of trains on wood or steel, are especially important. Safety depends on constant vigilance. The work of inspection, maintenance, and repair is never-ending. The men and women who do the railroad's work must be supplied with the tools and materials with which to do it. Picks and shovels, spikes and bolts, pencils and carbon paper, mops and brooms, wire and signal lenses, frogs and switches. The list is endless. Supplies are needed not by the dozen or the pound, but by the acre. Acre after acre, building after building. Here in these piles of materials and equipment, at our general stores in Sacramento, matched by similar stores at Oakland, Houston, Los Angeles, Portland, El Paso, and with still more supplies at division points and other places, the full magnitude of a railroad becomes apparent. Into this yard, too, come the bent spikes, worn rails, broken shovels, salvaged by the train load. Some to be reclaimed, some to be sold. But mostly, it's a matter of handing out, giving men the things they need to carry on their jobs. It works like this. A signal maintainer in the middle of the Nevada desert needs new lenses for his signals. So he writes a requisition. His order is duly filled along with others from station agents, roadmasters, section foremen. The lenses are delivered to the supply train. These supply trains run constantly along our lines, covering the full 15,000 miles of mainline track every 90 days. Have you ever sat up nights studying a mail order catalog? Well, that's what we are, a mail order catalog on wheels, delivering things to our many customers, large and small. And don't think Sam Adams won't yell just as loud if we forget his dustpan and broom as Al Swenson if we forget his switch points. 
or if we forget that signal maintainer and his lenses. Inspection, maintenance, and repair work enough for many men, but there are times when, in addition, we must build anew. Here, a river on a rampage threatens to undermine our banks, so we lay track in a new location and use the opportunity to straighten out a curve. Protection and improvement both. This is good thing we do. We fool the waters of El Rio and make spread the corn. This dune is friendly, go more fast, is more safe, is much moderno, is, is better. And me, Juan Gonzalez, I help do these things. If the senor is traveled off his make plans on paper, but where they be without the pig and shovel, eh? Me and my compadre, we do this work. It's good work we do. See, we make things better. Yes, it is good work. These men will make the railroad better, better than it was before they did their job. There is satisfaction in that knowledge. Satisfaction that at times even expresses itself in song. Listen to this extra gang in southern Louisiana. <laughs> at every turn. The majesty of the silent mountains, tall trees and open meadows, clouds rolling in across the hills, bold spires against the sky, the rhythm of the restless sea swirling among the crags and caverns, in ceaseless movement like a living thing. The endless solitude of desert country, grotesque, desolate, with a fascination all its own. Beauty in unexpected places, beauty that is world-renowned. The intimate loveliness of bayou country, the clear brilliance of mountain lakes, Lake Tahoe, Crater Lake, bluer than the sky above. Mount Shasta and Shasta Dam. Yosemite. The peninsula at Monterey. Mountain, desert, lake and sea. Nature at her loveliest, waiting to be seen. The romantic lure of storied cities. San Francisco, with its famous bridges, where the modern is blended with the past where cable cars still scramble up the hills. And Fisherman's Wharf lends zest and color to seafood dinners that are world-renowned. New Orleans, Crescent City of the Gulf, with its picturesque Vieux Carré, the old Creole Quarter, most colorful of all reminders of our early days. Here, the pirate Jean Lafitte joined forces with Andrew Jackson to defend the city. And here, an old slave quarters makes a charming cottage. The South and the West, lands of great tradition. The Alamo at San Antonio. Here fought the men who gave us Texas. There were peaceful men as well, living the tranquil life in missions in California, in Arizona, and in Texas. Pleasant memories from the past as we enjoy the luxuries of the modern world. Palm Springs, for instance. Hollywood. 
Reno, viewed ranches in the desert. All the color and adventure of the West, the charm and romance of the South, the glory of the past, the excitement of the new, the sunrise, and the sunset. This is my railroad, an open road to scenic beauty, an invitation to enjoy the world. There is more to railroading than just running trains around. Behind the train crew stand the yard men, shop men, and many others. In front of them, there are others still, the front men of the railroad. Red caps, baggage clerks, ticket clerks, for instance. In the larger cities, such jobs are performed by many people, each a specialist in his own line. In the smaller town, however, one man alone must do the many jobs the station agent, the man who keeps the railroad humming and who keeps it human. Well, as I see it, my job is to help both the railroad and the town. I'm the one man on the railroad who knows most about this town. And I'm the one man in this town who knows most about the railroad. So it helps both sides if we keep it human. When Millie Stevens tells me she wants to visit her aunt, I know she's hankering to stop over in the big city where she'll change trains. Maybe she won't admit that to me, but I know Millie. So I tell her about a couple of places where I had fun. No harm in that. Now Tom Waters, he's got some cattle to ship. Got problems of feeding them and hitting the market right. He's worried a little about getting cars on time. Well, I'll sure do my best to get those cars for him. Same as I would for any of my other customers. Sometimes I wonder who I'm working for, the railroad or the town. In the big city, it's much the same. A passenger knows only what he sees with his own two eyes. To him, the railroad is the red cap and the red cap's courtesy. The railroad is the ticket agent, friendly, courteous, prompt, efficient. He might well be otherwise. Whatever his manner may be, that is the impression of the railroad the passenger carries with him. The railroad is the baggage clerk. It is many other workers, a thousand jobs, each of them depending on the goodwill and craftsmanship of a railroad worker. Day in and day out, these men keep the railroad running in freight and passenger stations, big and small, in offices and in dining cars, for instance. The steward and the waiter. My job, one way you look at it, is a lot of things. Another way you look at it is just one thing. That's being friendly. It's just as easy to do things friendly as it is to do them mean. And mostly, you get back what you give. good toward people, they'll feel good toward you. And when the day's work is done, you'll feel a whole lot better toward yourself. I've heard men argue about which is the most important job in railroading. All I know is, 
If those people in the stations and offices didn't steer passengers and freight to us, our trains just wouldn't run. Sure, we could run them, but what for? Our job is hauling passengers and freight. Well, we got to get them first to do it. So it's like I say, it's like the chicken and the egg. I don't care which came first, just so long as they keep on coming. Trains must run regardless of the weather. Rain, hail, sleet, snow, fire, sand. This is the Salton Sea. Our rails once ran where you now see water. In 1905, the Colorado River overflowed its banks. It took two years to close the break that formed this sea. But we rebuilt our main line to the east. We kept the railroad running. Every year in the tinder dry mountains of the west, there are disastrous fires. Once fire was a threat to our operations, but we have learned to fight it, to fight fire with water, and to fight fire with fire. Fire no longer is a threat to our operations. We have won that battle. More serious is the problem confronting us in sand, ocean sand and desert sand, flat as a board or piled in dunes as high as mountains. When the wind breathes, the sand moves before it. In some places, we control this by planting special grasses. In other places, this cannot be done. When the wind blows, all bends before it. The force and fury of the wind wears the hard steel rail faster than the heavy trains that run on it. In such places, we must fight the hard way with broom and shovel, shoveling sand off the track, sweeping out the switches. This is no easy way to earn a living, but railroad men can take it. Working as steadily as the wind itself, for as long as the wind keeps blowing, sometimes this is days, sometimes weeks. Shoveling the sand away, breathing sand, eating sand, fighting sand, to let the trains go through. Sand must not stop them nor delay them. But in the final reckoning, a railroad is more than trains. A railroad is the men who keep it running. The battle of all battles is our struggle against the snow. Every hour of every winter, we must stand ready to meet its challenge. In the Sierras, the Cascades, the Siskiyous, hundreds of miles of mountain railroad must be kept open through an annual fall of snow that often piles a total of 25 to 30 feet. As the storm gathers its might and moves in, the train and engine crews know the power of the railroad will be mobilized to meet it. Men are called to duty, railroad men who are mountain men, men who have fought snow all their working lives. There is no fuss or fury, such men know. Know there is hard work ahead, know it will be successful. They know they are equipped to meet it with weapons that have mastered storm before. So they wait, waiting in reserve and awaiting orders. For the blind force of storm is fought by man's mind as well as muscle, by a powerful and complex organization that has gained skill and knowledge through the years. How does it look up there? It's getting worse. Orders are received. The reinforcements start moving up. Men and equipment are deployed to strategic points from which they'll be called as needed. The storm moves in in earnest. Always on the railroad when there's trouble, the man with the shovel gets to work. Switches must be cleared by hand. They must be kept clear, and they must be kept from freezing. 
Trains and snow equipment now use the rails together. They must be kept out of each other's way. At his board, the dispatcher controls all movement on the mountain. Hello, Truckee. Hello, Truckee. Lost my wire. Get the wire, Chief. When wires go down in storm, contact is impaired with trains approaching from the east. Contact must be restored. Mountain dispatches circuits out. Locate the brake, get the lineman after it. Out on the line, the snow plows swing into action. Speedy flangers clean out between the rails. As the snow gets heavier, the big boys start to bucket. Rotary plows take over and break trail for the trains. Trains must move. They will be snowed in if they don't keep running. Their speed is their protection. Passenger and freight running on dispatcher's orders. Orders that went over lines that now are down. Telegraphic test locates the area of the brake. A flanger drops a lineman to run the wire down. One man against the storm, one of many. But the railroad cannot wait. An emergency circuit is set up, circling the storm. Running through three states, 679 miles around, it bridges the gap between two poles, a hundred feet apart. At the higher altitudes, snowsheds have been built where experience has shown them to be needed. In the safety of these sheds, sometimes miles in length, one train can wait to let another pass. Out in the open, the battle against the storm continues, favoring first one side and then the other. The break is found. The men with the shovels continue work. There are times when the storm gets the upper hand. Orders are given to retreat, to surrender one of the two tracks to the storm, to use all equipment to keep the other open. Now the trains proceed with caution traveling in storm, traveling in two directions, on a single line of track. The dispatcher sends his orders. Over the temporary circuit, the trucky operator now receives them. They are passed up to trains before they enter the area of single track. At the beginning of the single track itself, a train master takes control and flags the trains through one by one. Yeah, I got it fixed. How's the weather out there? Sunny California. In time, the storm begins to wane. The cleanup starts. Spreaders widen the path kept open by the rotaries. Move over, Snow, we've got a railroad here. And these are the men who know how to run it. Yes, sir, the men and the equipment to do the job. We can really push when we set our mind to it. The clouds roll by and the sky is blue again. Fast-moving flangers continue the mop-up at a rapid pace clearing snow from between the rails. But where the snow is heavy, the rotary is still the big boy with the push. Yes, this is my railroad, and I'm proud of it. You can tell what a railroad is made of when the going gets really tough. This is my railroad. running through sun and storm to carry the people and the products of a nation. A railroad is many things, roadbed and rails, trains and stations, shops and offices. But above all else, at all times and in all places, 
A railroad is railroad people. Who are railroad people? Who are these people who make a railroad? We are a plain and friendly people. In the cities, towns, and rural districts of eight states, our men and women are valued citizens and friends. Through its patronage of our railroad, the community in which we live gives us the work by which we support our families in decency and self-respect. We, in turn, contribute our full share to the welfare of the community we serve in the form of taxes on our homes, our incomes, and our belongings. Through our purchases from the grocer, the butcher, the baker, from all the merchants up and down the main streets of a thousand towns, we are members of the church. We are active in school boards and other civic matters. We are members of service clubs and women's clubs, and sports clubs too. Both as players and spectators, we all have fun. Don't we, bub? We sure do with bands and banners and drum majorettes. When the whole town turns out to celebrate, when a whole town turns out to do honor to the men and women of the railroad. Yes, we are plain and friendly people. We who run the railroad, we who keep the railroad running by day and night, in sun and storm, in summer and in winter. This is my railroad. A railroad is railroad people. Men and women working together to do a job, to perform a useful and necessary public service, to maintain the free flow of a vigorous and energetic people, to maintain the free flow of the products of our fields, our mines, our factories, so that one man may share the product of his labor with other men, and they may share with him. It is in this manner that we in this nation have built of our way of life the most abundant on this earth. It is in this manner that we will maintain it and make it more abundant still. This is my railroad, a heritage from the past a service to the present, a dream for the future still to come. <laughs>